Good morning. Last week, we talked about Jesus as the cornerstone of the church. It is his strength, his message, and his love that enables us as members of the church to grow in our faith and to exemplify that faith by our actions. Reverend Stallworth described the church as a mosaic. None of us are clones of one another. We are separate individuals, and our diversity adds to the unique strength and the beauty of the framework of God's church. We don't have to possess the same talents or physical abilities. The harmony comes from the cornerstone. Today's lesson from 1 Corinthians reflects Paul's attempts to remind a newly formed congregation that living a holy life includes both a spiritual and a physical commitment. I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body. For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside of his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Last week, <clears throat> uh, when we uh, discussed the cornerstone we realized that, that Jesus was our support. Well, that's something that, that Paul is trying to reinforce uh, in his letter to the Corinthians. In uh, Acts 18.11, we're told that Paul came to Corinth, and it was about 20 years after Jesus' crucifixion and 16 or 17 years after Paul had become an apostle. And Paul stayed there for about a year and a half, forming a community of believers. 1 Corinthians was written about three years later from Ephesus, where Paul's mission efforts were growing. Paul had earlier sent another letter about maintaining holiness to the Corinthians, but that letter has, has been lost. And we now have just 1 Corinthians as a response to the church about specific concerns that members had mentioned as a result of that first letter. As one of the most thriving seaports in the Roman Empire, Corinth was home to some people of immense wealth and to others who were extremely poor. There was no middle class. The church that Paul had founded had some representatives from each of the two groups. Most were poor, but there were several prominent businessmen as well. Most of his congregants had come from a Gentile background, and the Greek and Roman societies of their heritage <clears throat> 
were hedonistic and involved acts of debauchery and sexual immorality. Prostitution was not only tolerated, it was a major business. It was even incorporated into some of the paganistic worship practices. In the worship of Aphrodite, temple prostitutes were selected to engage in sexual intercourse in hopes that blessings of fertility and prosperity would come to one's family to his flocks, and to the crops that he tried to grow. 1 Corinthians is Paul's attempt to minister to a church that was divided over issues of sexual immorality, envy, jealousy, lawsuits, marital problems, confusion over the Lord's Supper, and the proper use of spiritual gifts. He tries to to deal with each of those in turn in his, in his letter. Paul tries to remind the people that in spite of some internal tensions, they must not forget that they are consecrated and sanctified people of God. Reverting to previous lifestyles or allowing business or personal disagreements between church members to erode their harmony and their unity of purpose was beginning to take its toll. And Paul was trying to minister still to his church. Verse 12 mentions an issue of lawsuits and rifts among the people. Paul recognized that each had individual rights, and that would include rights to protect property or business. But he promoted the idea that attempts to reconcile differences in a spirit of love with an effort to honor God and to build up the body of believers should be foremost in the minds and hearts of these people. He wanted to eliminate ill-willed actions against one another in order to maintain unity and love in the congregation. He was also concerned that rash decisions could be personally detrimental, and the people impulsively acting had to know that hasty choices have consequences. Verses 13 and 14 take on a different issue about these personal choices. Paul uses food as an illustration of a person's physical needs. Just as it would be natural for a person to eat food, why would it not be a personal choice to engage in sexual relations as one chooses? Well, Paul reminds the people that one's body belongs to God and should be revered as such. The body isn't for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And if we are destined to resurrection, our bodies have both present and eternal value. In other words, he was saying there's a dignity and sanctity of the body. In verses 15 and 16, we're reminded that believers in Christ have connected us spiritually to him. We should rever that relationship and not tarnish his image by immortal, immoral actions. Paul is probably talking about the physical relationships of people in the church with prostitutes, something that would not only have been condoned in their previous religions, but perhaps sanctioned by them. The common acceptance of this practice by the larger community put additional pressure on these Corinthians to compromise their faith. The sleeping around verse with prostitutes is not something that's merely locked into the time period of the first century. Violating the will of God by acts of infidelity distorts one, one's claim to holiness and refutes the sincerity of that person's witness today. Paul further adds that most sins are committed outside the body, but sexual immorality is a sin against one's body and would destroy a true relationship with God. A person's body cannot be considered God's temple if it does not maintain the sanctity of a relationship based on love. The question in verse 19 was one that tried to reinforce the point to the readers. It was a question to help them avoid temptation. 
Don't you know that you have the Holy Spirit from God and you don't belong to others and you don't belong to yourselves? I mean, today we live in a nation that calls itself the United. There have been numerous references throughout our history about the melting pot of our society, a blending of many races, nationalities, and belief systems. In truth, however, we can look back at discrimination practices throughout. We still see conflicts between identities as individuals and identities as unified citizens. It would be great if we lived in a nation where people genuinely loved and valued one another, where the words under God was a guiding principle instead of mere political rhetoric. To me, a nation under the auspices of God would reflect his love in thoughts and actions, particularly in our relationships with one another. The church should be the model for that practice. Paul's church was struggling to understand what it meant to represent God in their daily lives. The issue of sexual immorality was becoming a central issue in that struggle. So as their mentor, he asked them to set themselves apart from the carnal practices of society. In a comedy routine, a Southern comedian once attempted to tell his audience that there was a distinct difference in the words naked and naked. Naked, well, had a more derogatory meaning to him. The word naked, he said, meant without clothes, like the way a baby is born into the world. Naked, he said, meant without clothes with a devious purpose in mind. I think Paul was telling the church to avoid nakedness. Of course, we may say he was talking to a different society, a society of promiscuity where women were disrespected, where sexuality was flaunted, a society where the church was being challenged by outsiders whose carefree lifestyles concerned them and by insiders who wanted to follow some guidelines but disregard others or who wanted to disassociate with some of the members because they came from a different ethnic or social status. Was Paul's letter only appropriate for that era? Somehow, the series of questions that he put, put forth in the, to the Corinthians seems to still echo through our nation and our churches today. In verse 9, he asks, Don't you know that people who are unjust won't inherit God's kingdom? In verse 15, Don't you know that your bodies are parts of Christ? Verse 16, don't you know that a person who is joined to someone who is sleeping around is one body with that person? Verse 19, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? And don't you know that you have the Holy Spirit from God and you don't belong to yourself? Perhaps the question for us is, don't we know that our church can use the individual talents of each of us if we dedicate our minds and bodies to his service? If we cannot answer yes to this question, maybe we should try harder to remove the barriers that separate us from God and from true fellowship with one another. May we pray. Dear God, please help us cleanse our hearts, our minds, and our bodies to make us worthy to serve and worship you. Amen.